Wow, the energy is beautiful right now. Um, hi, my name is Shade India. I am a cinematographer, photographer, and community organizer. I came all the way out here from LA to talk to you guys about my love and passion for cinematography. Um, today we're gonna be talking about everything from the technical to the creative, but before we get into it, I kinda wanna gauge the audience, like how many cinematographers do we have in here or people on the journey to cinematography? Okay, okay, beautiful. Or how many photographers do we have interested in cinematography? Okay, okay. And then how many directors, creatives do we have in the audience as well? Dang, okay, I like that y'all are listening to the technical side as well. Um, so honestly, I can't start to talk about cinematography without talking about the beginning of my journey, right? So here we have baby Sade <laughs> on the far left um, with her OG Canon T3i, that's like a dinosaur right now, <laughs> um, in what I'd like to call my play period, right? These were some of my very first images. Um, and at this point, I didn't know anything about nothing. You know, like I was lighting with literal desk lamps in my bedroom. The center image is a family member of mine that I had asked to sit in for me to recreate this iconic black and white um, portrait of this chess player, Bobby Fischer. Um, and I was just like so interested in black and white photography at the time. And um, this, I didn't know too much about texture or color or anything. I was in middle school, high school, and I just lit this with a side key uh, with one of my desk lamps. And then the right frame um, was from one of my very first photo series called Live in Color, where I had sold poster prints of this image um, at my high school to raise money for unhoused folks um, in my hometown, San Diego. Um, and all of these experiences kind of made me collectively want to pursue image making as a per career. I knew that I had an eye for something and I knew that I wanted to use um, activism with my art. And so I applied to film school, I did the whole gag, um, thinking I was finally gonna be with my people and in a world of creativity, only for it to really be a boys club. <laughs> and I think this image is pretty iconic because it explains my experience perfectly. At the time, I didn't truly know what cinematography was, but I knew that I wanted to create moving images, right? I had a love for movies. Um, and it was definitely a struggle for me at the beginning because a lot of folks had already had a background on a lot of the gear, how to uh, maneuver an Alexa Mini. Um, I didn't even know what that was <laughs> at the time, you know? Um, but it pushed me to keep asking questions, to not, that feel, not let that feeling of being an other um, define me, you know? Um, and this lack of representation at the institution really led me to start my own production company called The Red Futon. And the Red Futon had no real business plan, right? It was not nothing fancy. We didn't have no budgets. We were shooting from my literal living room. Um, this is, <laughs> this is um, some photos behind the scenes of uh, my apartment in Pasadena. And I was doing a bit of finessing. I was using some of the gear that we had access to in film school. And I actually bought a three light um, bicolor soft box kit from b &H for my early days in filmmaking. And this really allowed me space to play with my own terms and allow myself to mess up on my own terms without judgment, you know? And um, I just knew that this space was needed for me because I wanted to create a space for folks of color specifically, not even just in camera, but in makeup, in art department to um, get their hands um, and their hands like deep in the gritty and get on set as much as they can. Um, so these are some of the images we were able to create in my living room, which I, I still think is crazy. You know, this was um, a lot of my early days. This is how I found my eye, my niche. Um, let me see. Oh, we were working on a mixture of things. We had um, the top left is from a music video. We were creating lookbooks for local clothing brands, um, local artist portrait shoots, and creating this space for my community really helped me find my niche and find my people. And I think finding your people is something I'm gonna keep talking about throughout this whole deck, <laughs> um, just because I think it's so important and pivotal to your growth as, growth as a cinematographer. Um, and all of these collective experiences led me to find my gaze as a cinematographer. And I'd like to describe a cinematographer's gaze as your visual language or your interest. It's how I in instinctually choose my camera and lenses, why I gravitate towards certain colors and textures with my lighting, uh, where I chose to place my camera for a certain frame, right? Um, how I want movement to evoke feeling and perception. Um, so I would say these are some of my 
kind of key points for my gaze, what I like to call my gaze. I have a strong love for magical realism. I am very much so a dreamer. I grew up watching a lot of the films from French filmmaker Michel Gondry, uh, who would play with a lot of um, mixing practical scenarios with things like impractical lighting cues and set design. Um, but I thought it would be cool to like play with that twist and bring that to uh, black narratives specifically, because it's something that we don't so often see, right? Um, Another thing is surreal like approach to filmmaking through camera movement and lens choice. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this later more in depth, but my lens and my camera choice is very much so influenced by story. Uh, with this, I like to create a dreamlike texture and color to highlight and emphasize on black skin tones, highlighting our beauty regardless of the scenario. Um, I'm also very involved with production design. I'm always making sure that our color palettes are on the same page, and I'm really big on establishing practical lighting so we're all on the same page. Um, and lighting. Lighting is a very, very big thing for us. We've got to make sure our melanated folks is looking right on camera, um, which I'll talk about more as well. Uh, a big part of my lighting style is what makes me stand out as a cinematographer. I gravitate towards warm, large, and soft key lights with deeper shadows to um, highlight our skin tones. And I would say like all of these things, being able to pinpoint all of these things over the course of my journey has really helped me move with confidence in my career, you know? As black women specifically, we deal with a lot of imposter syndrome and uh, affirming ourselves, are we supposed to be in the room? And sometimes as I'm navigating different projects between different directors and clients and all these other voices, like being strong and confident in my power and what I have to say as an image maker has really helped excel me further than I'd ever imagine, you know? Um, so I think it's important for every cinematographer to go on this journey of finding their gaze. Um, so I'm gonna go into a little bit of samples of my work. So I kind of want to open up to y'all before I go deep into this. Um, do you get, uh, just call, feel free to call out different things. What does this moving portrait make you feel? What do you think about when you see this image? Intrigue, Intrigue? okay. Warmth. Warmth, okay, I like that. Uh, Vulnerability, Vulnerability. Ooh! okay, you already saw it. Okay, okay, what else? Ooh, you see me deep now. <laughs> Beautiful, yeah, this was from a video installation I had done um, about, um, it was kind of like an abstract piece about manifesting the kind of roles we wanna see for black women on screen. And so, you know, as a cinematographer, sometimes you, you need to get that itch out, right? You need to work on your own personal projects and sometimes you step into that directing bag. And so for this project specifically, I was directing talent, but it was a collaboration where I had collaborated with local actresses that I really admire um, to create um, surreal-like instances of stories or roles they'd like to take up on screen. And so this, um, this actress, she is traditionally on TV sets, and she had mentioned to me in one of our earlier conversations about feeling like she, feeling like she always has to put on a face for the TV shows that she's traditionally on and not being able to show black women in a really raw and natural and vulnerable form. So you saw it in itself. And so with the cinematography, I wanted to keep the lighting very soft and natural on the face, but then also highlight the hair texture on her. So I had a harder backlight coming from behind her with a Lico, what we call a Lico. So it's kind of like a, a stage spotlight, spotlight and it's a tungsten source. So it's warmer and it's harder, it has more output. And then on the left of camera, we had a soft, we had a soft sky panel with the um, chimera on it, just to have you know some of that soft fill on the back. And then we had a source from above called a light mat that was a soft box, just to bring up some of the texture on her face. But I also wanted to make sure I was maintaining that deeper shadow, so we had some black moving around between shots for, with camera, just to create that deeper shadow and kind of it's kind of like a little contour on the face, you know, <laughs> um, which I do a lot in my lighting style. And in terms of camera movement, this is where the surreal camera movement comes, right? Um, we had a Steadicam operator on this, uh, Adeshola, great operator in LA. Um, and I wanted to feel like we were slowly venturing into her world, but she was leading the mark. And so we did this a few times, and she was leading the way with the pacing. And when she did the look back, then we kind of made it all in tandem, and it created this beautiful moment on screen. Uh, this is from a really fun project I just recently did for Crocs, Lil Nas X. 
Um, he brought the energy on set. We wanted to make sure that we were capturing his energy in the right light. So we leaned into wider focal so that we could get closer to him with camera. And so you see his arms kind of distorted on the sides because he was like maneuvering his outfit, which really played well on camera. So I had shot this on Alexa Mini with the cooks. Cook is here too. Go visit them if you can. Um, because the cook look is unbeatable. Like I'm always using cook for more commercial projects, I feel like, because um, it has a soft, warm glow and texture to skin. Um, but then I also add additional filtration, like for this one specifically, um, because the shoes that he was wearing, they had like these little gemstones on them. I wanted them to pop on camera. So I put on this filter called Dream Effects that basically makes highlights shine on camera. And you see like a little sparkle, you see a little ding, you kind of see it in his earrings if you look closely. Let's see if I can zoom right here. Um, and this was a fun one too because we got to do a mixture of lenses as well. So I had a set of cooks, but then I also had a set of zoom lenses because um, it's like, it's a hybrid, this was kind of a hybrid job where I was shooting BTS for a photographer as well, and then the photographer was directing. So you have those moments where you can hop up in front of the talent and the director's um, calling out different actions, but then also because it is a still shoot as well for the company, you have to hop off to the side, quickly hop on a zoom lens and get your shot as well. So it's a mixture of both. This was for a short film that I had done called The Island. Um, this was a labor of love. It was about this, it's, just to keep it brief, it was this uh, thriller about this Caribbean family that goes to Jamaica and they experience a sudden loss, right? Um, but did y'all think we shot this in Jamaica? What's it look like? No. <laughs> <laughs> this was definitely shot in LA, but I tried my best to bring the warmth of the Caribbean to LA. <laughs> so um, a big thing is I wanted to like kind of emulate the sun from camera left side. So we were lighting through this large window that you don't see on camera. Um, and we created a, a large book light with a, a source called the M18, which is an HMI source. And we bounced it into uh, unbleached muslin, which is like a warmer texture to highlight skin tones, warmer skin tones and then um, threw it through magic cloth. So it's essentially like, imagine this is the source, this is what it's bouncing off of, and then it's going straight into another diffusion. So it's like a super soft, large source to emulate the sun. Um, and then on camera, I threw on some, uh, there's this filtration called coral. Um, it kind of warms up the overall image. Um, you have something similar to it in photography as well, but um, in motion, I use this a lot when I'm trying to, um, a lot of the time, sometimes you can't really get your schedule right to shoot on a warm, sunny day, so you have to cheat it on camera. And so I'll traditionally use like the coral quite a lot to um, kind of cheat on camera as well. And then I also threw on a quarter black pro mist, which is another softening filter that I like to use. It's, more, it's less intense than the dream effect, so it kind of gives you control to create certain looks for different projects. Do you guys have any call outs about this image? What do you guys think looking at it? What do you feel? That's your family? Okay, yes. I love that. What about you? Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's a great call-up, because that's kind of what we, we were trying to play with. You see how as you look to the right, the um, talent starts to fall deeper in shadow, right? The younger son, the uncle, the daughter. We had, put, uh, we had intentionally put black on the right side of camera to kind of create more of a deeper shadow on the folks closer to the right. So we were trying to be very intentional with even where each talent was staged within this frame. And we also don't have many regal portraiture like of black families in a Renaissance-style-esque Renaissance like, um, setting, right? So this was uh, fun all in all. Uh, what'd you say? Yes, exactly, and that's what I'm trying to um, get y'all to leave home with, you know, like how can you create images that um, are grounded in intention, you know, as you navigate through different kinds of projects. Um, this project, this was funny because uh, <laughs> I was just a BTS photographer, but this don't look like no BTS photograph, you know? Uh, um, the talent team, Yara Shahidi, uh, an incredible actress, model, um, activist as well. Her team had requested to have me on set and it's really beautiful because it's like a lot of talent are um, taking the initiative to get black women behind the camera on set and on their teams, black people in general. 
Um, so it was really such an honor to be invited to <laughs> be her personal photographer for the day. Um, and these moments are very interesting because you really get to be a fly on the wall. Even though I am primarily a cinematographer, I throw all that ego out the door and I just show up to set as a photographer that day, right? So I'm shooting BTS, but I'm also watching how the other cinematographer and director are working. I'm taking notes, but then I'm also getting my shots as well. And so sometimes you're more flying the wall, you're shooting um, talent with like a camera in frame, you see all the set elements, but then sometimes you get those little moments where you can hop up in front and be like, hey, can you just look into my lens for a quick second and get your shots? And um, you get incredible results like this. And this was just shot, shot on my, my personal Sony a7R2, Sigma art lens, 1835, and then I had thrown on uh, that Dream FX filter on camera again, just to get more of a softer glow. And it was crazy, because it's like, I just um, randomly had picked up this job, and then I added this to my portfolio, and this ended up helping me book other um, like branded commercial photo, photo shoots. So it's, it's important to take a mixture of jobs on, because you never know like what could lead you to the next opportunity, right? So, I mean, this is probably a lot all at once, you know, and you're, you're probably asking yourself, like, how do I find my own gaze, right? And I think it's important to realize that it takes time. This has been years, work, years of work, but I'm also still growing and expanding. And I think it's very important for cinematographers specifically to always be a student to the process. You know, in film school, it was like all these film bros in the back <laughs> saying they already know everything right away. That's not true. Everyone's still learning. There's so, new... Um, new sets of glass like coming out every day. Cook just dropped some new glass. And I think that's so important is like to always um, be pushing yourself to expand in your craft. So for me, even though I've done all these projects, I'm still always learning. I'm always watching um, camera and lens tests online, nerding out, coming to expos like this. Um, going to the rental house to test is so important. Um, and then also even when I'm out in the real world, <laughs> even if I'm just going to a bar with my friends and I see that the practical lighting is really interesting and they're creating this beautiful ambiance and I'm, I feel like it's a great reference for me to recreate later, I think that's always really important too is to pay attention to the world around you because that's eventually the best influence you could get, you know? And also another thing is to shoot as much as you can. Like I said, these were all different scenarios, different budgets, but they all gave me different takeaways and helped me test different kinds of gear that really helped pivot me and prepare me for the next job. So I kind of want to open up to y'all, like how would you guys describe your current gaze as a cinematographer? You can answer out loud, you can journal for, la for later, but it could be one thing, it could be a few things. What catches your eye? What gets you excited to shoot? You could just call out different things. Dreamy stuff. Dreamy stuff, okay, elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in your own process, like, have you noticed any, any like dreamy perspectives in your own work? What do you like to do? And that's something beautiful to explore, if that's something you want to show within your films. When you go home, like, find ways. How can I make this look right on camera? How can I create this reality, this, this world of reality and this world of dreamers, you know? I think that's, that's beautiful. Uh, anybody else? Like, are there any key storylines you want to tell? I see you raising your hand. I don't know about, like, storylines. I like kind of like the movie vibe. Like, uh-huh. Like, two hours, like, shadows. Like, I really like that kind of movie. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And do you implement that into your process all, at all with lighting, camera choice? Yeah, like I try to keep the exposure down. Okay, okay, underexposing, yeah. yeah. What else? Um, I just like pacing, like, even though we meet in the movie, like, it's going to really take the shooting every day, so like that kind of really kind of just, um, it's kind of interesting that kind of pacing that I'm going to be in the process. 
Exactly. Yeah, in, in New York, I'm constantly inspired because there's so many hidden gems. Like, the lighting here is so nice, too. Like, you can, find, you can come up on so many different experiences. That's beautiful. And I think that's something to explore as you create your mission statement as a cinematographer. You know, if, are you from New York? Okay, yeah, so that's, that should be a big part of your journey, the kind of stories you want to tell, right? And it's important to be able to start talking about these things out loud, right? Because, you know, it's like the hard part of being an image maker is being able to talk about your work. You know, sometimes we just want to shoot. We just want to be behind the camera. We just want to focus on the technical. But you also have to be able to communicate what, what interests you, what kind of projects you want to take on, what makes your work stand out, because that helps you get hired for the next job, you know? Beautiful. Anybody else? One more? What's up? Um, so I've seen you do some of the main shots. Okay, okay, yes. Yeah, I think my, my case is so much interesting to me. I've traveled a lot over the last couple of years to New York and seen some. Uh huh, uh huh. And I've been really amazed at the bright and like different colorful, yeah. and really much more fluid. And I think coming from New York, you know, it's like just colder, the lighting is just different, there's a lot more structure. So I'm somewhere kind of balancing between those two and not kind of blurring them because I'm also so new to it and so. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's I already want to see your work. You already sold me. <laughs> I think that's really beautiful. I think that's so important too. Like I'm, I'm originally from Belize, and there are times when I'm on a project and I'm referencing like a flickering porch light at my auntie's crib. You know what I mean? Like little nuanced experiences like that will help your lighting stand out because it's so oddly specific to your experience that people are enthralled with it. You know, so hold on to that. That's really beautiful. Yes, thank you for sharing, guys. Um, so I'm going to go into breaking down the role of a cinematographer from start to finish, from prep to post. I'm still kind of trying to explain to my family what I do as a cinematographer, so hopefully y'all catch on to me. <laughs> um, but for me, um, this is kind of like the key points of what I do as a cinematographer. Um, it first starts with that project pitch, right? For me, that's my favorite part. I mean, y'all saw <laughs> all my business <laughs> before this, but being able to um, come up with visual references or curate camera and lenses for a certain project, um, lighting direction, that's kind of the ideation phase. This is what gets you, it gets the clocks ticking, it's what keeps you up at night, right? And so um, I think this is really important too, even um, for cinematographers to take really serious as they're pitching because it also like pushes you to um, take the project seriously and know that this is the right project for you. If you're getting all these ideas running and it's, it's just like an endless streamline, that, that means it's the right project for you. And so traditionally, I'm creating uh, what I like to call a cinematography deck, which I'll go over later so you guys can kind of see how that works. Um, that goes into um, certain things like framing cues or um, lenses, filtration, camera movement, um, lighting direction, um, stuff like that. And then fast forward, you're interviewing for the job. Usually I'll go over this um, presentation and sometimes it's constantly in the work. Sometimes you have an initial look in mind and then you're meeting with the director and they're like, yes, but what about this? You know, And that's constantly pushing you. And then when you start to hire a crew and your gaffer's telling you, oh, you can only really afford this, then that's also pivoting the look as well. And so um, this deck that I'm gonna show you guys later constantly kind of evolves as you get into projects. Um, next is camera and lenses. Camera and lenses is kind of my favorite part <laughs> of it all. I'm constantly looking at uh, lens tests online just to kind of kind of get a flow of what I like, what I attach to. You know, I'm looking at um, color of lenses, texture of lenses. Um, sometimes certain lens. I'm I've noticed I'm more drawn to large format lenses that uh, have more of a surreal look, where you open them up to a wide t-stop and there's like a slight curve around the edges and you're focusing center because a lot of my work is magical realism. But maybe some cinematographers, they prefer a cleaner look, you know? And so that's something you kind of have to pinpoint on your journey as a cinematographer. What lens characteristics really interest you and um, as you're preparing for the next job, it's, it's just good to have, we kind of have to be a little bit of a, like a, a dictionary, a Rolodex of just gear. <laughs> Um, and so when a director's saying, oh, I really want this shot, but I don't know how to do it, you need to be able to say, oh, why don't we try it on this? Da -da -da, what do you think about this? Oh, watch this lens test. And so um, certain directors, they're more or less involved with the process. It's really dependent on who you're working with. 
uh, lighting direction. Um, this is usually in my initial um, project pitch as well, where sometimes I'll break down every scene of how I want it to light it, how I want color to look, how I want texture to feel. Um, do I want a high key look or do I want a moodier look? You know, uh, What am I trying to say? What is the tone of the scene? Um, these are all things that I'm asking myself. What, um, what is going to be my primary source between all of these scenes? That's, those are things I'm workshopping with my gaffer. Um, shot progression, that's your shot list, right? Um, how you're going to go about your day, how many shots do you need to complete your story, complete your setup. Um, this is a collaboration. Like some, Sometimes, for me personally, like how I like to shot list is I like to meet with the director and <laughs> get into the nitty gritty. We're going to sit down for five hours, however long we need to, and go line by line. What did you mean by this line? How do you want people to feel when this actor says this line? You know, asking these questions so that you really feel like you're in sync with your director for when you actually start to get shooting. Um, but then some directors, I've been on commercials where they already have a shot list. You just got to figure it out. <laughs> and so that's also a journey, too. That's another challenge as a cinematographer. We need to be able to adapt to both of those experiences. And uh, next is shooting schedule. A big thing is shooting schedule, making your day. On commercials, you got to make your day, or <laughs> it's not going to look good for you. Um, so that's a big thing um, that I have to do in my process, where it's usually me. It's our assistant director. They're usually handling the schedule for the day, our director. Um, sometimes it's a um, it's glam team. Sometimes they have certain callouts. Um, production design that's also a big thing. Just seeing how we can make our day and make the most of our day. And then after you finally shot, you still you still gotta figure out post <laughs> with your team. And so um, some some directors get you involved in the post edit and some don't. So it's kind of hit or miss with who you're working with. Um, and then as you get into color as well, color is a big thing for cinematographers, making sure that your image is being maintained in post-production. Because I don't know, somebody, have you all ever had your work release log? No color, yep, 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 it's not the best. So you wanna make sure that you're going out of your way to communicate to your director, to your post team, um, your intention for the look of the project. How much time we got? Can I go into this deck? Ooh, okay, okay, we're gonna go into this deck. Um, so this is a project I had done called um, Sonia Dora. It was a short film, I'll keep it brief. It's about uh, this young Caribbean woman um, from Haiti that moves to New York to pursue her dream of dance. And this was something I incredibly related to because that was my reality. I grew up in Belize with uh, my parents and I had moved to the States to pursue a better education. So it was a story that really, ooh, sorry. <laughs> it was a story that really <laughs> hit home to me. It, that did hit home. Um, so I'm gonna go through this deck to kind of show you guys how I go about traditionally pitching for a short film. Um, let me see if I can do this. Let me know if y'all see this. Okay, right. So this is how a traditional cinematography deck looks for me. I have, um, so uh, a big thing that I use is this website called Shot Deck. Do any of you guys use Shot Deck? That, that is the truth, right? Because um, as filmmakers, we have to kind of be a library of films. We have to have a bunch of references in our mind. And so um, tonally, even before I'm making this deck, I'm looking for images, right? I'm looking for images that evoke the tone, the feeling, the color palette. Um, for the project that I'm setting out to do. Um, so I use traditionally Shot Deck. Um, I've recently been using um, this website called Kive AI, which is really cool. You can like upload um, videos and it'll pull stills from videos. So it's kind of like, you know, like you have to like ratchetly screenshot <laughs> every, every still you want to keep. It saves that process, which has been really nice. Um, Pinterest, I use this other, um, site called Eye Candy, and it goes more into like framing and movement, which is a really great one as well. So I always like, like we're talking about intention, right, earlier. I think a big thing is I like to pinpoint the key main themes that I want to explore with the cinematography. So isolation was a big consistent theme in this film. That feeling of the American dream, that creative spark. And I wanted to ask myself, like, how am I going to show that on camera? How am I going to use lighting, color, and texture to showcase that? So initially, I, w I knew I wanted to shoot on anamorphics because I wanted to have a wider field of view. At the end, there's this surreal dance sequence that um, kind of takes us from reality to um, a surreal world where 
we're bringing Haiti to New York and we, she goes into this beautiful final dance scene. And so I was leaning towards this glass called the Cinevision Anamorphics because they had these incredible abstract flares. And you, you can kind of see it in this test on the right where you see like these abstract shapes and circular spheres, these linear streaks. I wanted all of this to pop on camera to kind of make that ending dance sequence feel like a painting, you know, because it's her final moment. It, we're finally seeing what all the hype is about and why she does what she does. And so um, I like to pinpoint just because, you know, some directors, they're into the technical, some aren't, you know, so I'll pinpoint notes of like why this glass stands out. Um, and then I'll show lens tests and then a dramatic sample as well, just so that they can see them in different scenarios. Uh, filtration, I'll pinpoint filtration I see um, for the certain scene. I'll kind of skim through this just because I'm quick on time. <laughs> but um, you all will have access to this later. Um, aspect ratio, I knew I wanted to shoot 239 to bring that expansive feel we we're talking about. Framing cues, we we're talking about how can we show isolation on camera. So um, we were shooting a lot of frame within a frame moments. And then we also wanted to create that feeling of vulnerability we were talking about earlier where uh, we were constantly framing our lead hero's um, center frame to kind of show like we were her, we were in her world. She was our hero. Um, movement cues. We wanted to establish steady cam for this. I'm just gonna kind of skim through just because we low on time. Um, selective color. I really wanted her to pop from the background. We were, someone was talking about color earlier. How New York? You were talking about. Mr. Jamaica, <laughs> we were talking about how New York is very muted, right? So that's kind of what we implemented in this, where the world around her was very muted, and we had like grays, blacks, whites, and then we always put her in a vibrant orange or red to make her pop center. Um, we had this lighting cue of dramatic highlights. I really wanted her to always have dramatic highlights to kind of show her dreamer personality, but then also create this contrast of hopeful versus hopeless. So on the right, um, this was supposed to be like her boss that won't let her go to the dance recital in the film. Um, so we lit him with softer eyes to kind of create that story contrast. Um, I wanted golden light to always find her just to bring that, um, that feeling of creative spark in the, in the main theme. And then this is just like a rough reference of how I envision lighting every scene. Usually I'll pinpoint specific looks just so that this is really helpful when you start to hire a crew because then your gaffer is on the same page of how you envision every scene. And so I'll put specific notes of what is going to be our practical source or our main source of light in every scenario. Um, what time of day are we shooting? Is this interior, exterior, X, Y, Z? Um, this was, uh, this wasn't, I'm not going to show this later, but this is um, just a few references from one of my favorite cinematographers, Bradford Young. If you don't know him, you need to know him. He is a black cinematographer. He has paved the way for all of us. Um, but what I've taken the most from him is um, whenever he enters a location, he likes to black out the room. So he'll black out the ceilings, or he'll black out the floors, the walls, or all of the above, depending on how deep or moody in contrast he wants to go. And so that has been really helpful for me in scenarios where I didn't have time to fully light a full location, but I still wanted to create mood and texture within a scene. These are some more references from his work as well. Um, and then <laughs> this is the, I'm gonna go over this scene briefly. This was from the ending dance sequence I'm gonna talk about later where we wanted to establish a sodium vapor street light coming through the window. And um, we're in, in this scene, this final scene, um, there is a lighting cue, right? We were talking about reality versus the dream world, right? So we had this transition. It was, this is just, this is, I'm excited to show you all this. Um, it, was, uh, it was a fun experience because we had to create two lighting looks. There was one real world and then there was one surreal world. And so for the real world, we just had the street lamp coming in and then deep blue tones around her. And then as she starts to go into this dance sequence, the lights shift into color and we create this uh, blue, um, purple and pink color gradients to bring Haiti to New York. And so it was this, just this beautiful electric moment on screen. So this is, um, this is an example of a from set to scene experience. So um, before your shoot, you're having a tech scout where you're basically going to your location and s establishing how you wanna shoot out your scene, right? And so 
we were shooting at this dye mill <laughs> um, that hadn't, it was giving nothing. There was fluorescent lights from above. Um, it was kind of messy everywhere. So we had to do a lot of work to kind of dress this space, right? Um, but this, um, having our scout kind of helped us establish where we want um, our key lights to come from and how we want to establish color, how we're going to dress the stage. Um, so this was some behind the scenes we had shot um, on Steadicam for this because the whole film we had established more of a handheld visual language because we were kind of creating that contrast between real world and dream world, right? So um, a lot of our talking heads were all handheld, but then when we finally go into this final dance sequence, we're shifting into Steadicam and the world comes alive. And then we also had, um, we didn't have like too much of a budget for VFX. We wanted to do, you know, like um, Brandy as Cinderella where she has like the dress transition and it was all in one shot. We didn't have the money for that. So <laughs> we had to problem solve, like how could we cheat our shot progression to still make this transition feel grand, right? And then we also had art department hooked up to uh, those washing machines with fishing line and they were opening the laundry machine all in within one shot, um, trying to get the perfect shot. So it was all kind of like a dance in front of the camera, but also behind the camera as well. And it all kind of played together beautifully. Um, and for our lighting, um, for that initial look, like I said, we had a street lamp coming through. We had used a, a joker to kind of emulate that street lamp. And we had put, um, I believe it was like a half CTO to warm up the source to kind of create that um, sodium vapor look. And then, we had a source above, it was a soft box, but we didn't have too crazy of a budget to build a traditional soft box, so we had built them with um, quasars so that it was much lighter as well. And then we put like a half grid diffusion over it so that she had some kind of soft fill on her face when we go into the stand sequence. And then on the left and the right side of camera, we had two sky panels um, creating this color gradient. So you see this purple and this blue here is kind of cross lighting behind. Um, but having that overhead source really helped us control her skin tone, even though we had all this color coming from different sides. So we basically had lighting coming from every direction to give us control. Um, and this right here is something I like to do a lot. This is uh, called an unbleached floppy. Um, and sometimes when you feel like you need to bring the fill side up, but you still want to keep it natural, we'll kind of ping a source into the unbleached so that it's like a soft, warmer texture on the skin. Um, this is something I like to throw in between shots as well. Um, this is from uh, some promos I shot for Black Panther. Um, this was a great experience because it was definitely more, it was more of a very overly technical job where we were playing with different schedules for talent too. So it was a lot of green screen work as well and matching our lighting. Like we'll shoot one week, three weeks will pass and we'll shoot again and we got to match the lighting. So we had to be really <laughs> on our T's, <laughs> P's and Q's for the lighting and so um, I'll just go briefly over our setup. This was the render of the set. I knew I wanted to bring like the warm glow of Wakanda and like these gold accents on the skin tones. So we had like a large warm uh, tungsten key. Uh, it was a 10K mole beam and we bounced it into a gold checkerboard so that we had like this gold shine on the skin. So it's a gold checkerboard. It's basically like a mixture of gold and white. So um, there's like actual like kind of like a gold reflector you know it, that's on the texture but then it's also white so it's like a mixture of like shine but then also softness and that helps them all pop on camera. Um, I want to talk briefly about building a website shifting more into professionalism. The part that we all kind of dread and avoid is the branding side and talking about your work and putting yourself out there and trying to get the next job. It's tiring, <laughs> um, but it's really important to work on um, paving your website, right? Um, when I had first gotten signed, um, I, my website was not cute, right? I had everything on that website. I had every single project I had ever shot, and that's not the best rule of thumb to do, you know, because you want to put your best work forward, and you want to be able to um, put the projects that you're trying to manifest more of. And so um, later today, from 2 to 4, I'll be doing a portfolio review, so if you guys want to, it's down the hall. Um, if you guys want to come with your websites or your portfolios, we can kind of talk more about this in depth. Um, to close out, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about cinematographer demographics. I thought this was very interesting. In 2021, this was the survey of the gender and race disparity among cinematographers. And I think this is um, something that we can't run away from as cinematographers. Uh, as a black woman, a young black woman specifically, like. Pulling up to set, people already have um, 
an instant impression of me. And sometimes I'm the boss of folks like almost two times my age. And so this all goes back to um, talking about our gays as cinematographers, being strong in your power, being strong with your lighting overheads and your camera direction, and being able to communicate the creative so that when you show up to set, you're doing it with purpose. And sometimes there are jobs where I'm working with crews that I don't know anything about, you know, but having that key deck has really has really helped me stand out as a cinematographer and have the folks who are working with me um, gain respect for me, you know, in a new light. Um, so these are some of the, this is some of the community I've been able to build back home in LA. Um, putting this together made me just really emotional because it's like, this is a space that I didn't have coming up and now we're in this incredible wave, new wave of black and brown cinematographers. I think it's so important and I really wanna encourage you guys all here to start creating those spaces amongst yourself. Like talk amongst each other. You guys could all be crewing up for each other. You guys could all be working with one another and um, these are just some of like the incredible experiences we've had over the years from camera workshops. Um, some, I did a, um, there's this, a nonprofit called the JTC List, where I was paired up with mentees, and I were able, I was able to bring them uh, um, to the camera prep to kind of get their hands on camera, and now they're seconding on jobs in their own worlds, and I think that's really exciting. Um, so spaces like these are very important. Even this expo, like being able to be here and speak to you all about what I love to do and what makes me stand out as a black woman cinematographer is very important to me. Um, I also want to shout out Made in Her Image. It's this nonprofit that I work with um, that's dedicated to the advancement of women and non-binary folks of color. Uh, we've done workshops, screenings. I taught like an online cinematography course um, with partners like A24 and Panavision, which was really exciting. And we were able to do some digital classes as well. So even though we're LA-based, it's still important to tap in because there might be some digital classes you guys can be a part of. Um, if you guys just want to screenshot this for later, this is some other great organizations to get involved with. Yes, whip your phone out, get involved. I love this. <laughs> and then resources. I'm so big at leaving y'all with some things to take home. Take a screenshot of this. This is what I use to create my decks. It's what I use to create my website. Um, there's a shot list template in there as well. Shot designer is what I use to make my lighting overheads as well. And that is it. Thank you guys again for coming. I could go on for hours, but I hope this talk, if this talk has done anything, it's inspired you to move with intentionality, right? To face the uncomfortable and start creating within your own communities.